First, let's explain what exactly range of motion refers to. This refers to the change in joint angle we experience during an exercise. This is usually defined relative to a full range of motion, meaning the maximum range that the joint can move through an exercise. For example, a full range bicep curl would refer to lifting from a fully extended elbow angle to a fully flexed elbow angle. Once the full range of motion is determined, partial range of motion can then be defined as lifting with anything that isn't full range of motion. However, partial range of motion can be performed in different ways. For example, you could perform a bicep curl in just the mid range of the exercise, you could perform just the top half, or you could perform just the bottom half, or at any other portion of the exercise. So what range of motion should we train with? First let's look at the influence of range of motion on muscle growth. The best evidence we have on this topic is this meta-analysis. The analysis included studies which compared training with a full range of motion versus any form of partial range of motion with the same exercise. Overall, it was found that there was a trend favoring full range of motion over partial range of motion, but the differences were marginal. However, interestingly, a subgroup analysis found that the specific type of partial range of motion implemented had a larger impact on muscle growth. When the partial range of motion is performed through the range where the muscle is at a shorter position, it tends to be inferior to full range of motion training. Whereas when the partial range of motion is performed through the range where the muscle is at a longer length, it tends to be superior to full range of motion training. One reason for these findings is likely due to the influence of muscle length on hypertrophy. When training a muscle at a longer length, we generally see superior growth compared with training the same muscle at a shorter length, assuming all other factors are equated. This is seen both via the evidence surrounding range of motion, as well as exercise selection. For example, this study compared the effects of training a muscle with different exercises which train the same muscle at different lengths. 14 untrained adults performed 3-5 sets of 10 reps of calf raises 2 times per week for 12 weeks with progressively increasing loads based on each individual's performance. One leg performed the standing calf raise while the other leg performed the seated calf raise. The standing variation puts the gastrocnemius, which is the ball-shaped upper calf muscle, in a more stretched position on average compared with the seated variation. However, the length of the soleus, which is the flatter lower calf muscle, is the same between both variations since it isn't influenced by knee position. After 12 weeks, both the lateral and medial heads of the gastrocnemius saw significantly greater increases in muscle volume in the leg performing standing calf raises compared with seated calf raises. However, the soleus experienced similar growth in both legs. And when it comes to range of motion, we also see a similar phenomenon. For example, this study compared the effects of training through different ranges of motion on muscle growth of the calves. 42 untrained women performed calf raises on a leg press machine for 3 sets of 15 to 20 reps with all sets taken to failure 3 times per week for 8 weeks. One group performed a standard full range of motion. Another group performed partial reps in the initial range only, which is where the calf muscles are most lengthened. And the third group performed partials in the final range of motion only, which is where the calf muscles are most shortened. After 8 weeks, it was found that the full range of motion resulted in significant increases in muscle thickness of both gastrocnemius heads. However, the partials performed in the lengthened position were more effective, while the partials in the shortened position were less effective. So overall, all ranges of motion seem to be effective for building muscle, provided that you are training close to failure with sufficient volume. However, to maximize muscle growth, it seems that we want to at least include the lengthened portion of the range of motion in the exercise. This might be via standard full range of motion, or via partial reps performed in the lengthened range. You could also use lengthened partials as a strategy to extend sets in some cases. This can be achieved by performing a standard full range of motion to failure, and then performing a few extra lengthened partials where it is applicable. For example, after reaching failure during a set of bicep curls, you might be able to complete a few more partial reps through the lengthened range. But just be aware that this strategy doesn't work for all exercises. Next, let's discuss what range of motion is best when training for performance goals. This is a little different from hypertrophy training in that the goal is to improve a performance outcome rather than trying to induce a morphological adaptation. And when it comes to performance, training tends to follow the principle of specificity. 
In other words, the more similar the training method is to the performance goal, the more it will improve that outcome. There are two primary performance related goals that are relevant to range of motion. The first is strength. When it comes to strength, the principle of specificity seems to also apply in the context of range of motion. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of full versus partial range of motion squat training on strength and hypertrophy. 17 untrained males performed squat training with 3 sets of 8 to 10 reps with progressively increasing loads 2 times per week for 10 weeks. Half the subjects performed squats to full depth, defined as 140 degrees knee flexion, while the other half performed partial range of motion squats, defined as 90 degrees knee flexion. As we can see, the partial squats used heavier loads on average throughout the course of the training program, shown in the orange, compared with the full range of motion training, shown in the blue. After 10 weeks, it was found that the deep squats resulted in slightly superior increases in quadriceps, adductors, and glute max muscle volume, compared with the partial squats, as we would expect since deep squats train these muscles at longer lengths. However, strength gains were a little different. The full range squats resulted in superior increases in 1RM strength of full range squats, while the partial squats resulted in superior increases in partial squat 1RM compared with the full range of motion training. So essentially, if the goal is to maximize 1RM of a specific lift, you would want to perform that lift with the same range of motion as the competition standard, or whatever standard you are using to test your strength. Although, it should be noted that this is only for the specific competition lifts. You may also include accessory lifts with the intent to hypertrophy the prime movers of those lifts. For these accessory exercises, you would probably want to use a full range of motion or lengthened partials in the same way that you would train to maximize muscle growth. And the other performance related goal worth mentioning is transfer to athletic performance. When it comes to athletic performance, the range of motion we train with doesn't seem to have a major influence on most outcomes. This was seen in this meta-analysis, which compared the effects of training with a full versus partial range of motion on various different outcomes. In terms of functional performance, which included tasks such as vertical jump height, sprint times, and wind gate cycling tests, there was a slight trend favoring training with full range of motion, although the differences weren't considered significant. So, although athletic performance abides by the principle of specificity, the training performed in the gym just isn't very specific compared with athletic movements anyway. So, the range of motion we train with probably won't have much of an impact on the magnitude of direct transfer it has to athletic performance. Instead, the role of traditional resistance training for sport performance is simply a way to build general strength and hypertrophy. For more direct transfer to athletic qualities, training methods such as plyometrics, loaded jumps, sprints, and endurance training are probably going to have a more significant benefit. Next, let's discuss the influence of range of motion on mobility and flexibility. Well, it seems that resistance training itself acts as a form of active flexibility training. And in most cases, resistance training increases range of motion comparable to that of stretching. This was seen in this meta-analysis, which compared the effects of stretching versus resistance training on changes in joint range of motion. Compared with no training, resistance training alone tends to increase flexibility. And when it comes to stretching, resistance training tends to improve flexibility to a similar extent. However, how does the range of motion we train with influence the degree of flexibility we achieve? Well, the only study I could find directly comparing the effects of range of motion on flexibility changes was this one. 24 adults with chronic lower back pain performed back extensions in a specialized machine through either a full or partial range of motion. After performing back extension training for 12 weeks, total lumbar range of motion improved to a greater extent in the group training with full range of motion. So, although evidence is limited, we would probably expect to see greater improvements in flexibility and mobility by training with a larger range of motion. And to be more specific, we would probably want to lift through the specific movement patterns and joint positions that we are trying to improve flexibility of. And the last factor that the range of motion we train with might have an influence on is our injury risk. It is sometimes assumed that training with a reduced range of motion increases our likelihood of injury or musculoskeletal pain. I am unaware of any direct evidence investigating this effect, and it is a difficult topic to study too. 
However, there are two indirect ways in which the range of motion we train with might influence injury risk. The first is via its influence on the weight we are able to lift. In many cases, lifting with a partial range of motion allows us to use a heavier load compared with a full range of motion. And while there isn't a direct correlation between the load used and injury risk, training with heavier loads might be one factor which increases the likelihood of developing joint pain over time. And second is via its effects on mobility. As we discussed, training with a larger range of motion is generally going to improve mobility in the way that the joints are trained. And you could make the argument that reduced mobility can increase the risk of injury during sports, functional movements, and everyday tasks. So as an extrapolation, you might argue that training with a full range of motion may be slightly beneficial for reducing injury risk. So overall, it isn't clear how the range of motion we train with influences injury risk. While the arguments are pretty weak, it is possible that training with a full range of motion might slightly reduce the risk of injury in the long term. Although each lifter should listen to their own internal feedback. If training with a specific range of motion results in acute or chronic joint or connective tissue pain, then train with a range of motion that you can perform pain free. Taking all this information into consideration, let's establish some practical recommendations. To maximize muscle growth, we want to make sure to include the range of motion where the target muscle is most lengthened. This can be either by lifting with a full range of motion or by performing partials in the lengthened range of the exercise. For maximal strength, you would want to lift through the range of motion that is specific to the competition lift. Although for accessory lifts which are intended to hypertrophy the prime mover of a lift, full range of motion or lengthened partials are probably going to be preferable. For athletic performance, the range of motion you lift with doesn't seem to have a significant influence. For more direct transfer to these qualities, you would want to perform more specific training methods, such as plyometrics, power, speed, and endurance training, depending on the outcome you are trying to improve. For mobility and flexibility, there isn't much data to go off, but it seems reasonable to assume that training with a larger range of motion will likely improve flexibility to a greater extent than partial range of motion. And more specifically, we would probably want to lift through the specific movement patterns and joint positions that we are trying to improve flexibility of. And in terms of injury risk, there isn't really much evidence to suggest an effect either way. Instead, lifters should train with a range of motion that allows them to lift pain-free and avoid certain ranges of motion if they are causing joint pain or discomfort. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.